So I'll be talking uh, about the complementary part of uh, online advertising, which is how do we come up uh, with those ads and how do we make them more causal? So I like to think about the causal bidding as being uh, uh, redefining the pie and kind of finding out uh, what are you paying for. And uh, this part, it's how actually you make the pie bigger. Um, so, um, so first, a special thanks to my colleagues, Stephen Bonner and David Rodi. Uh, some of the, most of this work has been done in collaboration with the two. Um, so the structure of talk, it's uh, the following. Uh, so I'll start with what is wrong with our recommender systems as they are now. Uh, then I'll make it more uh, clear and uh, more focused on why we care here at Criteo, which is product recommendation in ad optimization. Uh, I'll introduce for the first time, maybe today, uh, the causal inference framework. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, our method, and then of course I'll conclude with some next steps. Uh, so what is wrong with our recommender systems? Uh, so if you look at the modern recommendation uh, uh, systems research, uh, you see most of the like recent literature is uh, about uh, moving recommender systems to deep learning. So uh, you have uh, papers on matrix factorization extensions, so you have uh, word to vec like models, deep and wide, uh, neural uh, matrix factorization, graph embeddings. Uh, then you have uh, all the work on like taking the content of the items or the products you want to recommend and uh, kind of creating uh, deep representations then to compute these similarities with the users. And then of course you have this kind of user modeling aspect where you take time into account and you do like recurrent neural nets or uh, temporal, temporal convolution nets. Um, but then, uh, and uh, you see a uh, great uh, improvements in offline metrics on the tasks, on the data set, uh, you're very happy either in regression metrics or ranking metrics. But then if you talk to practitioners, what happens is that uh, you have kind of a, uh, iffy success uh, when it turns to, to take these offline uh, models and put them in production. Like when you run an A-B test, uh, you keep always your fingers crossed. You, and it's kind of a dirty little secret in the recommender system community uh, that the offline and online correlation kind of uh, between the metrics is not great. And uh, there are some uh, traces of this in uh, previous work, like uh, in the literature on missing nut and random. Uh, for matrix factorization in the Bandis literature, of course, it's kind of motivated from that. It's like, let's just give up, let's go online. Uh, and then, uh, kind of shameless plug, uh, there are new avenues where we want to discuss this. Uh, this is a workshop that we're co-organizing, uh, Reveal, it's at Rexis this year in October at Vancouver. Uh, if you guys want to submit some, uh, some early work uh, on, um, on causality or like offline online uh, correlation between uh, uh, performance in recommender systems, that would be great. Um, so, uh, so we know that this is not great, so we can improve offline, uh, we get better and better, but then online it's not always following what's going on. Uh, so let's, let's look at what actually is happening when we are trying to improve uh, models uh, um, in reality, online. Um, so what we do, usually we, we learn a supervised model, uh, we fit uh, the past user activity, uh, we try to evaluate offline using this uh, metrics that we just discussed, and then we A-B test. If uh, it's positive, great. If not, we iterate. So what we really do, if you look at this whole loop, we are really doing reinforcement learning by hand. So we are really trying at each step to, to kind of collect the data, uh, you know, learn something, act, and collect rewards, and do it over and over again, but very slowly and very error prone. Uh, and what we do is we use the wrong tool for, for this job. We use supervised learner, learning framework, right? Uh, this kind of first step here, we said we learn a supervised model from past user activity, right? Um, and furthermore, we don't only do we use the wrong tool, which is the supervised learning framework, we also use the wrong objective. So again, we say that it's either missing link prediction or next user event prediction. And really what we're seeing, what we're really saying for recommendation is that what we really want to do is kind of remove some form of friction. We are trying to do some optimal autocomplete of natural user behavior. Like the user will do this by himself, and we just try to kind of come and you know, say it for him. It's like, is it really this what she wants? Like, you know, like to, to save him a click, basically. Um, and this, uh, from the point of view of business metrics, right? Because you are working on a company that's trying to optimize something, usually like long term uh, revenue. Uh, learning to account on complete user behavior at the beginning when you do the first version of your recommender system is great. Uh, like, uh, it's a great initial recommendation policy. But then, what, what's happening after a couple of improvements? you see that these two objectives diverge, right? You, you still try to kind of remove this kind of friction and do better and better, but then you're not moving the business metrics, the ones that you carry in the A-B test. Um, so of course, what uh, any, any reasonable person will do is say, well, well, we collected user feedback on our policy, right? We now see uh, some form of uh, user feedback on the metrics we care. 
uh, because we did online tests, right? So we should be able to bring improvements uh, using this feedback, uh, like, you know, add CTR, post-click sales, dwell time, whatever you want, number of videos watched. And then uh, you start doing this, but however, this does not come without some caveats. And this is basically the subject of the talk. And not only uh, it's about these caveats, but it's for online performance advertising because that's where we want to go. So this is next section. Um, so let's say for simplicity, this is not where the this is not where the online performance advertising is right now. Uh, we, we move past the clicks, but uh, for simplicity, let's say that we're still in this world where we want to optimize clicks. It's a toy world. We, we have two, two kind of, uh, we, this is a final state machine and this is a user. And then basically he can go in two places. He can go on a, in a shop and then these are many, many pages there. Each one is a product page and he can transition many, many times there. And then he can go on a publisher and uh, transition again there and go back and then at some point in time stop. Uh, so this is kind of the game, right? This is kind of what the user can do in this toy world. And then he can only buy here. This is where we collect final rewards. And only we can show ads only here. So in this uh, case, and then with the simplifying assumption that once he's on the shop, he can convert any time with a constant rate, the only real uh, objective for our ads is to improve this transition back, right? To increase the transition back to the shop, like send him back to the e-commerce website, right? So the only job of recommendation is to find the right ads to show here, such that this happens more often than before. Um, so any questions so far? Is it all pretty clear? It's a, it's a simple game. I wish it would be like that. Uh, so now, if you look at the literature, we, we have two types of literature. We have the standard recommendation literature, which says, well, look at this kind of natural user behavior, use this as a matrix because you're gonna have now user product metrics with some uh, visit events, like he visited this uh, product uh, page. And then this is uh, what uh, usually people do when they do like next event prediction, missing link prediction, it's here. And then in computational advertising and bandits literature, they use this, right? This is the online feedback you got, which is biased, selection biased by the policy that you show. Um, so when you say, uh, when I talked about the initial policy, it's usually this. And then uh, when uh, you know, people talk about, you know, in band this literature about policies, they're usually based on this. Um, and the point is that both of them suffer from, this one suffers from some problems because it's not actually what it's optimizing for, and this one has the, all the problems we discussed already. Uh, of course, kind of spoiler alert, we should do both. Um, anyway, so this is uh, what I was saying. So then under the supervised objective, let's say that we're doing the right-hand side. So we're doing the, the clicks, we're doing the metrics of clicks. We're trying to, we're, we're gonna try to basically find the best ads for each user by just maximizing the likelihood of the observed clicks in the past, right? So we say, uh, I shown this uh, user these ads and he clicked on this and uh, similar users shown similar ads and this is where the clicks were. Then I'm gonna do an arg max and this is my uh, my basically my policy, and I can maybe randomize around a bit uh, this, uh, and this is this is almost state of the art uh, in uh, in what we do usually. So what what's wrong with this uh, with this uh, with this way? So if you look at the literature and you know critiques, uh, we have three three potential uh, problems. First, the worst case is that you're just no matter how much data you observe like this, you might suffer from Simpson's paradox. So you, you have some form of, uh, so some mixing weights that totally screw you off and you s turn uh, to the wrong conclusion. Uh, secondly, uh, you could say that, hey, if I have kind of models with limited capacity, like linear models, for example, uh, I'm gonna spend maybe too much far on, uh, on the areas where the logging policy collected most of the feedback in the past, right? So uh, I'm just gonna fit uh, where it's not where the reward is, it's where the reward was. Um, and then third, let's say that you somehow uh, solve the first and the second one, um, then you are just still hit by variance because you cannot really have a, a, you know unbiased estimator and with low variance in places we've never been before. So these are really the three big problems you are faced with. And the degrees of severity is according to, to my opinion. The first one, it's quite low under some assumptions on how the causal graph looks like. So you can look like at first backdoor kind of a criteria to, to reason your way out and say, you know what, maybe I'm not in danger to, to be affected by Simpson's paradox. So that can, you can get away with this. The second one, you know, there are some classes of models that, you know, have capacity wherever you need it and like a Gaussian processes and you can also kind of reason your way out. It's not the simplest model, but you know, there are papers there that say deep nets with dropout are Gaussian processes. So they, maybe that's even okay. 
But then the third one with the high variance, basically you are in the dark wherever you didn't explore in the past. So there, the only thing you can do, it's basically counterfactual inference and exploration. And uh, this is what we're gonna talk about next. So cause of vocabulary for, again, for the first time, um, classical setup in a, in a like kind of causal um, inference, uh, you say that you have a, a single action, do or not do, so you have treatment or placebo, and then, uh, then you have the stochastic setup where usually people are now, uh, where basically you have uh, like a huge catalog of actions, of products to show in our case, and then uh, treatment is a distribution over this and control is another distribution of this, and you need to, uh, to reason about these changes in distribution. So in the case of crypto, what uh, control policy would be, it's the existing ecosystem. Uh, and then uh, quantities that we're interested in, it's the average treatment effect, uh, which is basically what you get out of a randomized trial or of an A-B test. Um, so the only thing that you should affect the outcome should be the, uh, the change in, uh, in treatment. And then the, you know, the holy grail of everything, it's the individual treatment effect where for a, for a user you want to infer uh, the difference between doing and not doing something. And of course it's impossible. Uh, in reality, because we, these users are not really users, they're like mini user segments, you can think about this as being somewhere between an average treatment effect and individual treatment effect. Because uh, if you say uh, your user is really a person that visited these five products in the last two days, there are multiple users that are like that. Or there might be just one, but it's not really a single person. You are really fingerprinting a small class of users with that behavior. Um, so of course in recommendation, average treatment effect is not as important. Uh, you want to personalize, otherwise uh, why are you doing recommendation to begin with? Um, so now, uh, in terms of uh, more notation, so of course uh, the recommendation policy is just uh, the probability from which you draw the, the recommendations, right? So it uh, establishes the distribution over the products. Uh, and then uh, the rewards, it's, uh, it's coming quickly out of this. It's the probability of arrival of each user, probability of you showing a, 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 a certain arm, and then the reward you collect, and this is under this, uh, this policy, pi x. Uh, so this is the, the reward uh, that you collected with this, uh, with this policy, and then the incremental treatment effect then between uh, two policies becomes basically uh, or of a policy with respect to control, it's just the difference in rewards. And of course we're interested in the best one, uh, the one that maximizes IT, and it's quite simple to see that under some constraints, like, uh, you know, like non-faticability, let's say basically you show one single ad to each product, to each user, um, then basically the best thing to do is to, to find out, out of all the possible products for each user, uh, which one is the best, and just do that one. So it becomes a deterministic policy. Uh, so this is where we want to get, uh, but uh, of course it's highly uh, uh, naive because uh, it doesn't uh, take into account time and repeated uh, exposures. And of course uh, the, the state of, uh, the, the um, space of actions is, is huge. So you won't be able to enumerate. Um, so what, uh, what, are doing, uh, what are people doing right now to estimate this IT from observational data? So randomized data, it's, uh, it's sparse, you, it's scarce, you cannot use too much of it because it costs you money. So people are trying to use observational data as much as possible. So you have like these three schools of thought, I would say. Uh, the first two are more known, the third one it's less known, uh, it's just a couple of groups of uh, uh, in a couple of uh, places uh, that are uh, publishing on this. It's, I think, the most promising, but uh, so in order, we have the, all the counterfactual estimators kind of work. So you have IPS, which is totally unbiased by high variance. Then you have all these corrections, the doubly robust version, the self-normalized IPS, more recent work like the magic estimator. Uh, then you have all the off-policy uh, work from RL, uh, where you, you have more like Safe, uh, safe estimators, like worst case, and then you have all the, the work there. And then uh, the one that we're gonna talk about, uh, where uh, they, they think about causality as domain adaptation, as extreme domain adaptation, uh, where it's about uh, finding an embedding space where you can embed the, the users and the arms, such that you, you can bound the variance between uh, doing and not doing something. Um, so now this was kind of the segue into the method we're proposing. Um, so let's start with, with uh, you know, what you could do uh, naively. It's of course to, uh, as we said, uh, to, to be able to find out uh, for, every, um, uh, for every user the optimal, uh, the optimal arm, basically to, to find pi star. Uh, we could uh, use IPS because uh, since we observe this kind of 
reward that is biased by the current control policy, we need to debias for it. So we need to divide the empirical uh, observed rewards by the propensity of the current policy, and you get an unbiased estimator of how good that um, that uh, arm is. Of course, the main shortcoming is that uh, it's huge variance. Uh, the moment you move away from the current policy by just a bit, uh, your variance will explode on the very un, um, unlikely arms. And just for kind of, you know, to wrap your head around, it's like, let's say the median catalog for us is like 10 million products, right? So that means you need to do uh, IPS over 10 million arms. That, that just doesn't work. Um, so, but what we can observe is that uh, the minimum variance for this is, of course is under randomized exposure, right? But the randomized exposure, that means you recommend all products uniformly, so that means uh, you're out of business. Like by the time you collect your data, you, you, you just run out of business. Um, so what can we do? Uh, so the question we are exploring is, can we learn a predictor from, uh, from the control policy that estimates the, the, the performance under a randomized policy and use this uh, estimator to, to compute the optimal product recommendations. Uh, so instead of actually uh, doing this exploration everywhere, we do it on a very small sample and then we do a transfer uh, as if everything would be in that. Uh, so it's kind of the IPS trick, but in an embedded space. Um, so uh, as I said, we assume that there is this setup where we have a very large sample from the current logging policy. So let's say we run it greedy, so 95% we do exactly what our current policy does, and then 5% of the time we just do random, like we just show random ads. Um, and then we want to basically uh, take these two samples, let's call it SC from, uh, from control and ST from treatment, so the, the E greedy we call it treatment, and let's uh, see if we can do a joint, uh, basically joint uh, optimization out of this. Um, so this is not a fully new idea. So this is why I said that there is a little bit of work in this, the, in this direction. Uh, so the, the paper that got me inspired was uh, uh, this one, the learning representation for counter inference. Uh, that was followed up by another one uh, last year uh, by the same group. And then there is another group that did very similar things uh, uh, in Israel on, uh, on basically using uh, a small randomized trial to, to be able to uh, build better uh, predictor. This was for search. Um, so this is kind of the the related work in this in this area. Um, so um, so now going back to our proposal. So basically we we are saying that uh, we want to use these two samples and let's say that we want to do matrix factorization. And uh, let's say that we actually think that uh, matrix factorization like the problem is low rank and matrix factorization is the right model for the problem. Uh, then w what we can say is that uh, the response on the control and treatment it's actually only a function of a shared user representation, so the users don't change. And then what we did uh, differently, right? So we played some arms in control and treatment. Maybe we played them with different frequencies. I mean, that's kind of the only thing that can actually change between two distributions. And then uh, since this is actually, uh, this is the right model, then you can say that the incremental treatment effect between these two policies is just really the difference between these two inner products. So it's an inner product itself. So it's this UI with this unknown W delta vector, which now stands for the incremental effect of the uh, treatment uh, population versus control. Um, so what we're really saying a bit more graphically, we're saying that we have this collection of rewards, uh, basically uh, from control and treatment. So this is basically, let's say these are all the users and these are basically twice the number of products. So you have products once here and once here. And then you want to uh, jointly factorize this way. Um, so now let's look at the sub-objective. So this is a joint optimization problem. So let's look at the first term. So the first term, it's exactly in the space we want because it's in the randomized space. So there are outcomes in the randomized space. So here there is nothing special. You just do matrix factorization. And then, uh, so normal thing. So here you have a loss and here a penalty term on, the, on your factors. So here you observe that you, we don't think, basically we say that it's already a predefined basis and all the only three parameters are the products. So the regularized term, it's only on the, on the products. And then of course we know from, uh, from, our, uh, from our assumption that uh, the, the two, the embeddings for the same product in the control and treatment are, are linked through this uh, delta vector, right? So we know that we can actually do some form of transfer between the two models. So that means that for the second sample, the control sample, we can write a, a predictor that uses the treatment embeddings corrected by this W delta 
And then uh, you, you can, of course, uh, penalize both the, the treatment again and this W delta. And if you do a bit of notation manipulation, this is equivalent to saying that you will dedicate another uh, product vector for this sample, for the large sample, which is the biased policy. But you'll now have this, this regularizer term, not only on the, on the product vectors themselves, but also on the difference between uh, the product vector in treatment and the same product vector in control. Um, so now we'll have a regularized term between the distance uh, of the two uh, of the vectors for the same product under the two distributions. So basically this. So we have the the, the second factor, the second uh, optimization term. It's uh, it's under this constraint. So now if you put everything together, this is what you get. You get five minutes. Okay, uh, you get this uh, objective, this joint objective. Uh, so when you write it down, it becomes basically uh, you have a loss on these two product vectors, a discrepancy loss on the distance between these two, and of course a normal regularization loss on the product vectors themselves. Uh, so what's the relationship with uh, this and IPS? So if you look back at IPS and you say that these two things are now approximation, uh, approximated by inner products, you can say that once you regularize this, actually, you are actually regularizing IPS. So it's some form of variance reduction of the IPS term. So it becomes quite, uh, quite linked with, uh, with uh, uh, capping IPS or like controlling the variance of IPS. Uh, for the user, it's the same thing. So you can think about what if the users actually, uh, they also change in the two populations. It's not only what you show, it's also to whom you show. The same reasoning applies. Because I have five minutes, I'll skip. Uh, then the algorithm, the resulting algorithm is quite simple. It's basically a normal matrix factorization uh, like uh, algorithm. So, but now you have basically samples from the, these two types of batches, and you have another regularizer term. So you can run uh, some like an HGD or anything you want, uh, like alternate least squares, and uh, and you you're gonna be able to solve it a large scale as a large scale as you solved before. We were interested in something that really works as good as the original problem. Um, so in terms of experimental results, um, so the baseline is we did the Bayesian personalized ranking, a logistic ma matrix factorization method. We call it uh, supervised protovec uh, for, uh, let's say, uh, traditional like uh, internal reasons. Uh, but it's really uh, basically a logistic transform of uh, like the inner product corrected some with uh, normal bias terms. Um, then you have an IPS uh, weighted version of it. And the banded net uh, proposal uh, by Torsten uh, et al. Uh, that is a uh, iClear submission this year, uh, which is matrix factorization with self-normalized IPS optimization objective. And then uh, we uh, use MovieLens and Netflix data sets. Um, and we sample from them with rejection sample to, to be able to simulate this kind of uniform exposure in, uh, in test set. Uh, and, then in uh, and then we have a lot of baselines. And then let's get to the numbers. Uh, so basically what we see is that uh, in terms of lift over an average predictor, just using basically uh, the, the product um, uh, itself, uh, you, no, the, 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 the global propensity of uh, positives, uh, basically of ones in the, uh, in the data set, we have this, uh, these lifts in terms of MSC and uh, negative log likelihood. Um, as you can see, the, these are the, our three methods. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, with a single, uh, like, prototypical product uh, to regularize against. This is actually with splitting uh, the matrix in two. So this is using the treatment matrix, and this is using the control matrix, the product matrix. Uh, we see that, you know, we have quite large lifts uh, versus anything even uh, against, uh, like, IPS. These are two other IPS. This is a normal supervised. This is basically what you would run in production. And uh, Bandit uh, Net and uh, BPR, you know, you cannot run uh, regressions, but you can run an uh, AUC. So you have here, you have uh, uh, the BPR, which is not that great, like any other supervised method. Bandit Net works the best out of the baselines because it is supposed to be causal. And then uh, same, uh, same story with, uh, with the Netflix data set. So quite, quite large lifts. Um, in terms of, uh, like, uplift uh, as, a, as a function of size of uh, exploration, like how much exploration you need. Uh, we see that to like a two, three percent, we already start to, to beat uh, IPS. And then once we have 15% of the overall data set from the, like from e greedy, uh, we beat by quite a large margin. Uh, conclusions, it scales. Uh, further work, uh, basically um, time and uh, 
putting back the, this, this part, the organic behavior, because right now we only work basically on the, on the blended feedback. Uh, thank you. And sorry for being late. No, it's fine. It's perfect. We are perfectly okay. on time. I'm keeping uh, I rushed a bit. Schedule on. So, yeah, are there a question for uh, Flavian? Okay. I guess I was so clear. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I have one question. Uh, we always uh, we always make a difference between the type of uh, feedback we get. Right. So we have uh, explicit feedback. If we have implicit feedback. Yes. In the case we when, when we talk about Netflix database or Music Canada database, yeah, with explicit feedbacks. Uh, yeah. This is explicit feedbacks. We right? we, pre we pre process it like this. So we we yeah. turn it into into implicit feedback. Oh. So we say that the five star rating, it's a- So actually it's, it's a heuristic to consider that, to consider that as an implicit feedback? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, have you, 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 of course you've tested this. Maybe it's, you have a disclosure over it or something. Mm -hmm. In practice, what does it do? Uh, it's, uh, it's not yet there, basically. We don't know yet. Uh, okay. we're, we're trying to bring it uh, internally. We, it's, it's actually only on open data sets that we tried it. We want to bring it uh, back home okay, and uh, okay. try it. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Another question, a comment? No? So anyway, so thanks Flavian again. Thank you guys.